We were talking to some of our friends when we were on our way here, and our friends have been in Rojava. And when we told them we were on our way to interview you, they wanted us to pass on a message, which is that you have their full support over in Rojava. Is the feeling mutual? Of course. And I thank them very much for that. And the Turkish incursion, well, invasion actually, let's call it what it is, is utterly appalling. And uh, there has to be real pressure for an immediate ceasefire, withdrawal of foreign forces from Syria, but above all, long-term protection for the Kurdish people. I and mean, I've been involved with Kurdish communities for decades. The Kurdish people were badly treated at the end of the First World War and have been badly treated ever since in Iraq, in Iran, in Turkey and in Syria. And there has to be a recognition of the rights of Kurdish people to their own self-determination. One of the things to me which has been quite disappointing about the government's response, particularly from Dominic Raab, is that they keep talking about disappointment. They're disappointed that Turkey <clears throat> has pursued this course of action. I feel disappointed when I miss my bus. It seems to me that the government isn't interested in applying the kind of pressure that How about using about. words like appalled? What's happened is the US, I think, gave the green light for Turkey to do this, and that's why Turkey has now gone over the border and doing such awful things to the Kurdish people there. And as I said, there has to be a future for Syria which recognises the rights of all of the people of Syria. One of the things that I've always wanted to ask you is what was your politicisation like? What was the moment that switched you on and made you want to become politically active? There's never really one thing, I suppose. Um, I was very angry about the Vietnam War when I was at school. I was, this was the 60s. I left school in 1967. And um, I remember taking part in protests against the Vietnam War. And we had things in my class at school, debates about it. And I was usually in a minority of one. Sometimes two. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was not... I wasn't popular with my views on the Vietnam War. They all bought the view that uh, there was going to be a, an avalanche of communist uh, conquests all over the world if Vietnam didn't stand up against the tide. Seriously. That was the narrative. And so that politicised me quite a lot. I also got involved with War on Want at that time when I was at school. And then I went to live in Jamaica as a volunteer. And that taught me far more than I taught anybody else about the lives of people, the hopes, the aspiration. And I started uh, an interest then in Caribbean and African history uh, because it was a time of liberation in the sense of liberation of the mind of um, school children and others learning the history of the Caribbean, the history of the slave trade, the history of the abolition of the slave trade, the Morant Bay Rising, and all of that it taught me a lot. And then I came back to uh, Britain um, two years later worked in various places and so on, and then became active politically in North London, in trade unions and anti-racist campaigning, and um, dealing with issues of bad housing and poverty, and then became a councillor. Um, my big campaign to become a councillor was to oppose the demolition of three roads around Finsbury Park, and we won. And those roads are still there. Indeed, I cycled down them this morning. <laughs> I mean, and it's kind of nice when you sit, you cycle down this road and think, actually, yeah, we did something here. And it's a, it's a nice community. And it was the idea was to demolish it and build a, um, a council housing estate. Now, obviously, I want to build council housing, but I wanted to refurbish what was there. The council owned all, pretty well all the houses anyway. And uh, we won on that case. My mum remembers you from when you were a Haringey councillor. Oh, know? right. Because uh, you helped her book rooms for when she was doing anti-racist meetings and the like. So. Uh, oh, in the Civic Centre and so on. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess. So she remembers yeah, yeah. you from And back it in was, the day. Um, there was a huge um, anti-racist movement in North London. And uh, we organised a big demonstration against the National Front in 1977, St George's Day 1977, on Duckett's Common, Turnpike Lane. Uh, Bernie Grant and myself were the primary organisers of it, with others, but, but, you know, we did put the work in, if you like. And I remember getting calls from uh, the Labour Party head office and other places saying, uh, can you call this demonstration off? It's going to cause a lot of trouble and so on and so on and so on and so on. And so I said, no, 
We're, it's going ahead. We're having the demonstration. The only way to deal with fascists is to stop them. And um, we did organize this demonstration. Thousands of people came. Uh, the National Front tried to squeeze through. Um, and then they tried the same thing in Lewisham a few weeks later. Um, but it was the growth of a huge anti-racist movement, which your mum was absolutely part of. And what it, it was more than just a demonstration. It was uniting people from all sorts of different communities. So we had the, what was then the Haringey Labour Movement, anti-racist, anti-fascist grouping, which used to meet on Sunday nights. And it was actually a coming together of all of the communities across the borough. So it dealt with issues of uh, stop and search. It dealt with issues of uh, young black kids on Broadwater Farm Estate. All, all those issues oh, yeah, so came Dolly together. Dolly work and uh, yeah. the monitoring group at the time. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well. And so it was fascinating the way we brought people together. And the political legacy of that. You keep meeting people say, oh yeah, I remember you from so-and-so, I remember so-and-so there. And so what happens is when people come together on a specific and limited campaign, you never know where it's going to lead to. Those connections that are made um, and achieving things together empowers people. I mean, this is something that I want to think about in relation to today's context, because mm. Labour talk a lot about the real division in the society being between the many and the few, those who live off wealth versus those who survive off mm. work. But there is also this very deep conflict of political values, and sometimes that is expressed as a generational thing. So you've got very, very angry mm. middle-aged men. Piers Morgan is their king. They hate... Greta Thunberg, they hate the idea of transgender rights. They think my generation are a bunch of oversensitive, cosseted snowflakes. How do you plan on winning the culture war? Well, I'm not sure it's a cultural war. I think it's an issue about values you want and what you want in society. And so when I get uh, people saying to me, well, does your party speak for me or not? I say, well, actually, do you want your kids, they often have children, to get a university education or a good apprenticeship? Do you want your grandchildren to get a nursery? Do you want social housing for the future? Do you want a health service for the future? Or do you believe in the idea that somehow or other, your brilliance as an individual is gonna make it okay for you and the rest of your family? Because in any society, if you have everything competitive, there are losers as well as winners. And um, I think you can bring people together on those issues. And so having been involved in community action all my life, I'll give you another example, it was a proposal to build a grade separated road, virtually motorway standard road, through North London. I opposed that from the very beginning and I was chair of the Public Works Committee and the Planning Committee of Haringey and was very active in opposing it. I was, in a, again, in a minority on this for a long time. I said, no, you've got to build, it's obvious, there's more cars, you've got to widen the road. I said, no. It's obvious there's more cars because there's bad public transport. What you need is better public transport and cleaner air, and you'll get that, not by widening roads, but by shifting the argument around. Immediately, the argument is a very difficult one to put through. After a while, it becomes a very strong and very obvious argument. And so, yes, you have to meet people where they are and try and take them to a better place. But how do you have those difficult conversations? Maybe when you're out on the doorstep and you're face to face with someone who looks at you and sees you're part of that social force which is taking this country to the dogs. How do you deal with those real differences in political values? I'd as say, well as talking about you know, yeah. material circumstances. I'd say, well, look, who's taking the country to the dogs? A government that um, supports tax havens, supports tax evasion, allows Facebook to get away with paying, what, 28 million pounds in tax on a one and a half billion turnover? Hello? Math shows me they're not paying very much. And do you really want a society which plans for the increasing numbers of rough sleeping homeless? Do you really want a society where your kids are going to be 60K in debt because they've gone to university? And so you have to say to people there are also issues about how you spend public money. And we're not going to increase taxation for the vast, vast majority of people, but we are going to increase taxation for big corporations. We are going to increase taxation for the very richest. Yeah. We're going, to, we're going to do that. And it's the only way forward. And then you go into the issues of public ownership. I remember when Thatcher 
was busy promoting privatization of everything. They'd said, you know, all these themes that were used, you know, we're setting the people free by privatizing these industries. Thomas Cook was privatized. A load of money was made by a small number of people out of Thomas Cook. Eventually, an awful lot of people lost their jobs because of the collapse of Thomas Cook. The water industry was entirely privatized. What happened? Prices went up, leakage rates went up, properties were sold off, jobs were lost, and a contract culture was introduced. What's happened as a result of that? Massive losses of water for an expensive water service. Well, this is the problem with neoliberalism. Eventually, you run out of other people's assets. But the other argument I'd use is the levels of debt in our society are huge. If you look at savings levels, they're quite low compared to many other countries, personal savings. Personal debt levels are very high. And for middle-aged and older people, they're now getting more deeply into debt than ever before because their children can't get anywhere to live, either need a few thousand for a deposit on a private rented flat, if they can get one, or if they're trying to buy a place, they need massive support in order to get a deposit uh, to buy somewhere. Or if they're going to uni, they need money for that because of the levels of fees and, and the costs of it. And then you have another problem. If you're sort of 50 to 60 year old, you've got children going through college or uni. You've often got older parents who need social care, which you've also got to pay for. So you've got this massive debt burden being imposed on a generation that thought they were moving towards retirement. It would be relatively comfortable. Why? Because of the way We've rolled back the public realm because the way in which we've privatised uh, so many services and cut them back. And so what would Labour do? Invest, yes, in jobs and so on for the future through the Green Industrial Revolution. But we'd also be properly funding social care and properly funding education. Being in opposition is one thing and <clears throat> governing is quite another. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is a risk when you walk in to number 10 of being co-opted by the very establishment you've spent your whole political life fighting against? There's going to be huge pressures. I fully understand that. There's going to be enormous pressures on our government because it will be a radical government. The way in which we campaign now and the way in which we will conduct ourselves in the election will be about mobilising people to achieve that change. I'm not into top-down decision-making. I'm much more into the power and strength of grassroots democracy. Is there going to be pressures on our government? Yeah, of course, there's going to be enormous pressures. I fully understand that and expect to meet those. And we'll meet those, I hope, by maintaining and increasing the popular support for what we're trying to achieve. Because what happens to the movement? Because if I listen to the Daily Mail, I think that the movement is just a bunch of hard left thuggish nutcases. I mean, would that they were. And sometimes I wonder if actually we're more glorified door knockers. How does the movement function when you're in good, power? A very good point. We have a very strong and big movement at the moment, which are obviously knocking on doors and campaigning and mobilising people. But the whole point of community organising in the Labour Party is not just about door knocking. It's also about those collective conversations and debates in communities. It's also about empowering people, often at a very local level. I was at um, an event in Putney with a group of people in one block of flats. That block of flats is very badly managed by a particular housing association. Uh, the tenants had got together, formed a, a tenants association and were taking the landlord to task. But the interesting thing was they said, do you know what, we feel empowered by doing this. And they were people who thought they had no voice and had no rights. And so it is about changing the culture of the way things happen in society. And so our strength in going into government will be that we want to build more housing, we'll want education and so on. I want those people to be involved in developing those education policies, the National Education Service, water services, environmental impact and so on. And so this movement isn't going to go away. It's going to be stronger, more involved in delivering. So it won't be me or John or Diane or whatever that delivers everything. It'll be all of us. I've got some quick fire questions for oh you. Oh dear, this sounds complex. It won't be too taxing, I promise. You okay, I'll give so. It, give it a go. You are rumoured to be a Republican and you are definitely a critic of the Murdoch-owned press. Where do you stand in the war between Prince Harry and the Red Tops? Good luck, Meghan and, Meghan and Harry. Good luck, Meghan and Harry. That is 
No. No, it's no buts. No, the point is that there's been an intrusion in lives and the red top media have got to understand that we're going to legislate for Leveson too. We're going to... This invasion of privacy of people, yes, there is a right to know in the sense of um, if somebody is up to no good and is in a public position. But there isn't a right to interfere and intrude into people's private lives. There isn't a right to phone tap on people's private conversations. And I've got actually a lot of sympathy with um, what the way what Megan said and the way she said it. I mean, speaking of salacious gossip, what is the best rumour you've ever read about <clears throat> yourself? Oh, it's got to be the um, one about me and the pogo stick as a kid. What? I didn't hear this about pogo stick. I thought you were going to say Czech spy. Well, the Czech spy was... So, Exciting. Well, it was so ridiculous. But <laughs> what was the stuff about the pogo stick? The pogo stick, well, it's a shocking story, but it's a total fabrication invention. It is claimed that as a young person growing up in rural Shropshire, I was given a pogo stick for Christmas. Not true. I apparently used this non-existent pogo stick to go jumping down the road on Christmas Day. <laughs> As you, as you would, with your new Christmas present of your pogo stick. And there was a family across the road, apparently, where they just got a baby rabbit, which had been a Christmas present for this little girl. And she was very proud of her Christmas rabbit, which again is unusual, slightly unlikely, but there you go. And apparently I came jumping down the road like this with my pogo stick. And I was so skilled with the pogo stick, I was able to jump on and, and sadly bring about the end of the rabbit's life. You murdered it was a alleged, rabbit with a pogo it stick. It was alleged <laughs> I murdered the rabbit with a pogo stick. I just have to say, it's absolutely untrue. There was no rabbit, no pogo stick. There was no rabbit, there was no pogo stick. And um, the comment from the paper was that this woman who had given the stories of the paper, her sister said, my sister sometimes gets a bit odd with her memories. <laughs> I mean... But it, it was it was front page. That's wild. Yeah, it was. In some ways, I'm disappointed that it's not true. It would have been a sort of character building trauma. Wouldn't it? Do you I know mean, what come I mean? on, you yeah. Know, a pogo stick killed a rabbit. No, you can't do I that. once had a. No, you can't do that. Have you done? Have you got a pogo? Did you have a pogo stick? I did not have a pogo stick, but when I was so a kid, no rabbits got killed no by rabbits, you. No rabbits, but I did. Um, the the hamster was merely stunned. It it wasn't killed, but I was a kid, and a friend's hamster bit into my finger and wouldn't let go. And so I was a kid, so I panicked. So I just went like that, and it. The wall. I had a dog that did that once. I think the dog was getting short sighted later in life. And so I would hold the stick up like this, mm. you see. The dog would jump. It was quite fun, really. Grab the stick <laughs> and then run off with the stick. Sometimes brought it back, sometimes didn't. Oh, that's fun. So I held this out. Anyway, the dog sort of um, misjudged the position and clamped its jaws on my hand instead. Oh, God. <laughs> did you need a rabies shot after that? Nah, you... A very clean dog. Oh, I mean, you've got more faith than I do. Final mm. question. But the same dog uh, got in trouble in a pond once and I had to strip off, dive in and swim out to save it. So that was your Mr. Darcy moment? Epping Forest. Oh my God, that's cold. Well, it was New Year's Day. It was, Oof. But the dog had to be saved. I'd have been like, you know what, Rover, you made your choice, I'll make mine. Yeah, no, I'm dry. No, you wouldn't. Yeah, heartless, utterly No, heartless. you wouldn't. You would have done the same as me. I would have maybe asked someone else to go swimming in a cold pond. But final question. <laughs> okay. Final question. What if there's nobody there to go swimming in the cold pond? Uh, you know, it's sad to lose a dog, but some things are Allah's will, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's also the mulch between your toes going into a pond. That would freak me out. Didn't it freak you out? It was cold. <laughs> so you couldn't even feel what was between your toes. It just was cold. Numb. It was cold, yeah, yeah. But final question. If you weren't the leader of Her Majesty's opposition, would you be on bail with the rest of Extinction Rebellion right now? I'd be with Extinction Rebellion, whether I've been arrested or not, I don't know, but I'd certainly be... Um, I do support them. I support what um, they've done because they've actually woken people up, woken people up, and uh, I think the community as a whole has begun to understand this, that um, what we're doing to this planet is destroying biodiversity, 
making the climate warmer, melting the ice caps, polluting so much. Um, there isn't a solution <clears throat> of running away. There's nowhere else to go. That sort of back to the land green movement of the 60s and 70s is simply not a tenable option. The only option is using the technology we've got to use less energy, to make our buildings more efficient, make our transport more efficient, and also look at our agriculture and the systems that go with it to increase biodiversity and at the same time ensure a food production. So I want to lead a government that will work for, with, and enhance the Paris Climate Change Accords and have a trade policy that um, supports human rights and environmental protections all around the world. None of it's going to be easy. Everything's going to be very, very difficult. But the public awareness now of the climate emergency is so real. That day in September when there were hundreds, thousands of demonstrations all around the world, it's a wake-up call for all of us. So you're saying you might not be on bail because you might well, not have been I don't arrested. Know what, I, don't know what would, I don't know what would have happened, but... Um, you're a quick mover. The cuffs wouldn't have gotten on you. I can get around if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, as always. Pleasure to be here. Please Thanks don't nationalise us when you're in number 10. We like being well, in You don't want to be nationalised. No. <laughs> We're going to be too busy dealing with mail, rail, water and the national grid. Okay, well, and then we'll... So, so you'll be okay. Save us for your second term in office. You'll be okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers.